Hello everyone, my name is Gary O'Mealy, and in this video we are going to talk about hormone interactions. So what we're going to do when we eventually start talking about all the different endocrine glands and the hormones that they secrete, we're going to be studying the effects of each hormone one at a time, meaning that we'll operate under the guise of okay, that hormone's the only hormone that's in the blood right now, but in reality, the bloodstream is going to contain dozens of different hormones at any particular time. And the reality is that these hormones that are present in the blood together can interact with each other in a number of different ways. So what we want to do with this quick little video here is to discuss the different ways in which one hormone can affect the function of another hormone or several other hormones. So once we get this particular video out of the way, in the future when we start talking about particular hormones like, for example, glucagon, as we'll see here in a second, we'll understand that even though we're talking about glucagon by itself, there are other hormones that are also acting in the background, and we'll just have to kind of assume that those hormones are doing what we're going to say they're doing here in just a minute. Okay, so there are three major ways in which hormones can interact with one another. The first one we're going to discuss is called synergy. So when hormones have synergy, they will produce stronger effects when they are together, working together in the bloodstream than they otherwise would produce all by themselves. So the best example of this, which we'll discuss on the next slide, is the actions of cortisol, glucagon, and epinephrine and how they together affect blood glucose. And then another one that we'll just kind of offhand mention are the synergy between testosterone and follicle stimulating hormone and how they stimulate sperm production in the testes. We'll have a future video on uh, the male reproductive system and spermatogenesis, so we'll probably bring that up again then. Okay, so let's look at that first example of cortisol, epinephrine, and glucagon. The empty graph that I'm showing you right here shows serum glucose in milligrams per deciliter on the y-axis and time in minutes on the x-axis. What we're going to see here is we are going to see the effect that the injection of each of those three hormones has on the levels of glucose in the blood. The idea here is that all three of the hormones are going to individually have effects on raising the blood glucose, but what you're going to see is that individually these effects are rather weak. So we'll start with cortisol. If we inject cortisol at time zero, you can see blood glucose comes up just a little bit, but it's nothing to write home about. Same goes for glucagon. Injecting glucagon will cause blood glucose to go up a little bit, but again, it's nothing too terribly impressive. And same goes for epinephrine. This is the idea of synergy. If these three hormones are acting all by themselves, then we're not going to see very strong effects on what they're trying to do. But look here, if we co-inject epinephrine and glucagon, meaning that both epinephrine and glucagon are doing their jobs at the same time, we see a much, much, much more impressive effect. Well, now you might be wondering, well, what if we did all three at the same time? Well, I'm glad you're wondering that because looky here. When all three hormones are acting together, we get a exponentially more impressive effect on raising blood glucose than obviously any of those three hormones acting all by themselves. So together, these hormones produce a much, much, much stronger effect than any of those hormones would produce individually. That is synergism. That is hormones that have synergy together. Okay, let's move on to the next type of interaction, which is called permissiveness. Permissive hormones unlock each other's effects. This is going to sound a little bit like synergy, but I'll do my best to contrast the two here. So let's consider hormone A only produces an effect if hormone B is present. That is different from synergy because if hormone A and hormone B were synergistic with one another, then both of the hormones would produce effects when they're by themselves. But here you can see the idea is that hormone A will only produce any sort of effect if hormone B is also present. 
So we're not going to specifically analyze these examples, but some things to consider here. Thyroid hormone and epinephrine. We will talk about thyroid hormone in the future when we talk about the thyroid and how thyroid hormone synthesis and secretion works. You'll need to operate under the assumption that, okay, when thyroid hormone gets released into the blood, it's only really going to do its job if epinephrine is there too. And we'll talk about epinephrine in the far-flung future when we get to chapter 15. And then sticking with the thyroid hormone uh, theme here, thyroid hormone and testosterone or estrogens effect on development. So thyroid hormone is absolutely essential for the development of early sexual characteristics as a fetus is beginning to develop into either a male or a female. So if t thyroid hormone is not present, then those sex-specific developmental effects are not going to occur at all or they will be severely delayed and severely messed up. Okay, and then the final type of interaction that we will see at least one, if not several, different specific examples of later in the semester is antagonism. Antagonistic hormones affect the same parameter. They, do, they affect the same thing, but their effects oppose one another. So, for example, the best example of this that we will look at here pretty soon in a couple of videos is insulin and glucagon. Insulin and glucagon are both secreted by the pancreas, albeit different parts of the pancreas, and they both have effects on the amount of glucose in the blood. The difference, though, is that insulin makes your blood glucose go down, and glucagon makes your blood glucose go up. That is why we call these antagonistic hormones. They are butting heads. Insulin wants to bring it down, glucagon wants to bring it up. This is clearly different from the synergistic hormones we looked at earlier, Glucagon, epinephrine, and cortisol all were affecting glucose in the blood, but they all wanted to increase it, whereas insulin and glucagon here want to change the glucose in different ways. And then in a later video, when we talk about calcium homeostasis, we will see that these two hormones here, calcitonin and parathyroid hormone, do the same sort of thing, except instead of glucose, we're talking about the amount of calcium in the blood. Okay, that's going to do it for this quick little video. Here is a list of vocabulary terms you probably ought to know. And then for checking your understanding, number one, why is it important to understand how hormones in the blood influence one another? And number two, what are the three types of hormonal interactions and what are some examples of each? All right, that's gonna do it for this video. If you have any questions, go ahead and drop them in the comments section and I will see you next time. So long.